Thank you very much, Sebastian. I am delighted to be here in Vienna. As Vasily said, we've uh, toured Europe. We started in Brussels, then went to Paris, London, Rome, and Berlin. And I've been in your wonderful city for the last several days, and I'm delighted to say we saved the best for last. So thank you very much for, for having me here. Thank you to the Renner Institute for uh, hosting and organizing this event, and of course to Vasilis and, and the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. Otherwise, I would not be able to be here with you today. Uh, I am also, as an American and an English speaker, very grateful that we're able to conduct uh, this session in English, so thank you for that. Uh, and also, uh, I have really been struck throughout my trip here this, this last week or so about uh, the interest that Europeans have in the U.S. election and the deep and, and serious knowledge that you, you all have about our election process and system. And that is a real privilege as an American, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for, for, that, uh, for that honor um, that you uh, take such a high interest in what's going on in our country. I'm also glad that I was able to do this at the end of June and the beginning of July, because if we had done this about six weeks ago, uh, I would be reflecting a situation in the United States where Democrats and progressives were doing what we do very well, we were panicking. The, uh, the Democratic uh, primary campaign was still ongoing, but the Republican race had ended, Donald Trump had clinched the nomination, uh, and despite most expectations, he had very quickly consolidated Republican voters, if not Republican elected officials and Republican elite, behind his candidacy. And we saw the opposite happening on the Democratic side, uh, deep divisions, and there was anxiety that the Democratic race uh, would go down to the wire and it would become very toxic, and the divisions that we're, we were seeing between some Bernie Sanders voters, uh, particularly young voters, who were telling pollsters, who were telling people in the exit polls when they would go vote at the primaries that they would not vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, Donald Trump pulled uh, even and even ahead in some polls, uh, and there was a lot of hand-wringing going on in the United States about the state of the race. Fast forward about six weeks, uh, and what we have seen is just about the worst six-week period for any presidential candidate that I can remember. Uh, Trump, instead of taking advantage of the time that he had at the end of the primary campaign, uh, where a lot of candidates build their infrastructure, use the fact that they don't have a, a, a set opponent yet to, to gain ground uh, in the campaign, Trump totally squandered it. Uh, he uh, had a series of self-inflicted wounds, uh, the first being something that probably broke through in the media uh, here was his string of attacks uh, on a judge that was overseeing a fraud case against him. Uh, and those attacks were based exclusively on the fact that the judge's parents were born in Mexico, even though the judge himself was born in the United States and was a United States citizen. Trump believed that his Mexican heritage disqualified him from uh, overseeing a, a, a case involving Trump because of Trump's position about immigration from Mexico and the wall on, on Mexican border. Now, that began a precipitous fall uh, for Trump in, in, the, in the polls, but it wasn't the only factor. Uh, another factor, of course, was the underlying issue of that case, Trump University, which uh, is about uh, a, a, a private, uh, for-profit educational system that was designed to teach people how to uh, sell houses and make money in real estate. It turned out to be a pretty big scam. Uh, that, that caused him some trouble. But really what uh, was harmful to him in the eyes of the American people was his reaction to the uh, Orlando massacre. I don't know if this broke through over here, but uh, we had the, the big terrorist attack in Orlando uh, several weeks ago now where nearly 50 people were killed. Uh, Trump's initial reaction was to congratulate himself for calling it. Uh, that is not the type of uh, typical reaction that we expect uh, in the aftermath of a terrorist attack from somebody who is hoping to lead the country. Uh, this certainly hurt him, and we saw it not only in the numbers uh, from polls in the national race, but in also how the American people view who would be best suited to handle uh, crises or terrorism. Hillary Clinton vaulted way ahead, which is unusual for Democrats. On the Democratic side, the race is now over. Uh, it's, Bernie Sanders has not formally conceded, uh, but uh, he knows and has announced that he won't be the nominee, and the Democratic Party has come together again very quickly behind Hillary Clinton's candidacy, 
In the immediate aftermath of the last primary, uh, we saw President Obama, Vice President Biden, and a very influential senator in the United States, particularly with the left, Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts, endorsed Hillary Clinton. That gave her a big, strong boost uh, and pushed her towards the, the middle and the end of the month of June, in which she ended the, the, the month in a very strong position. If you look at the the polling averages, uh, she now uh, holds between a five and a seven point lead over Trump, uh, which is a pretty strong indication of the, of the state of the race. Uh, that is uh, outside the margin of error. That is uh, at, at, a, at a level that we can feel confident. Um, unfortunately, that has provoked the other kind of reaction that Democrats and progressives in the United States do very well, which is complacency. Uh, we think this is in the bag. We think we don't have to work very hard. Trump is destruct destroying himself. He doesn't have a campaign. He doesn't have a fundraising operation. Uh, he doesn't have any ground or field staff. Therefore, this, is, this race is over. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's true either. Um, and m my mantra, which Vasilis has heard me say now, and this will be the sixth European capital that I've, I've made this statement, is no panic, no complacency. Like we're in a very strong place where I, I think Donald Trump has got a very difficult path uh, ahead to, to win the nomination. I think we'll probably get a little bit more detail about uh, uh, the, the, the potential path that he might, might have or the challenges that he does face in the Q&A. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop fighting. And the reason why is because Donald Trump is not a typical candidate. It's not from I'm a progressive, I'm a Democrat. It's not the same kind of thing should Donald Trump win if we just have a, a situation where uh, Republicans and conservatives get to uh, put forward their policies and, and take, take the country in, in, a, in a direction that I disagree with, but take the country in a direction that kind of fits within the norms and bounds of where our politics exists. Donald Trump is a totally different kind of candidate, uh, and there is, it's very difficult to predict exactly what the implications of his presidency would mean. I want to touch on just a couple um, for uh, how it would, uh, could impact the Europeans. Uh, and that is, this is the first presidential election since the end of World War II in which the two political parties have actually contested the U.S. role in the world. There's always been disagreements between the parties on how foreign policy is conducted, whether or not we're going to be more aggressive with their use of military, whether or not we're going to use diplomacy more. But there's really been a consensus about America's global leadership and our, uh, our desire to stay engaged in the world. This is different this time. Donald Trump, for whatever you can say about uh, a lot of his substantive policies and proposals, he has been very clear that he views the current state of the world, the current state of the US uh, global leadership as actually harmful to the United States. He looks at our alliance structure and feels particularly things like NATO uh, are a, a drain on the U.S. Treasury. We simply can't afford it anymore. And if we aren't able to radically renegotiate the way in which uh, the NATO is, is structured and funded, uh, then uh, we will have to withdraw uh, and p potentially pull back uh, not only from NATO, uh, but from Europe in general uh, and, and the rest of the world. That is radically different than what uh, Secretary Clinton is proposing. Uh, her foreign policy falls very much within the boundaries and norms of the democratic mainstream. Um, it would be largely very uh, a much more of a, con a continuity approach to what President Obama has done over the course of the last seven years. Uh, and again, it would continue uh, America's global leadership and America's engagement with the world. So this is the first time we've really had that specific contest. And I think very important for Europeans to recognize is that in this debate, uh, Trump always takes things too far. We, we, I mentioned the judge. We, we have uh, a lot of other examples of his uh, uh, xenophobia, some of his racism. Uh, in this instance, he, again, is taking an idea uh, too far. We've often heard American presidents of both parties speak of the need uh, to, to change the way the burdens are shared in NATO, to have it be more equitable, to have it be a little bit more uh, res responsive to the demands uh, of this global security environment. Trump has taken that and turned it completely around to a point where he now is going to demand that European countries pay more uh, or we will abandon them. Now, that could be renegotiation. I tend to prefer the, the phrase extortion. Um, but that is, uh, that is what he uh, intends to do. Uh, that being said, it's important for Europeans to understand that there is a certain amount of resident, resonance in the United States 
for the message that our international military commitments are too expensive for the United States to handle as they're currently constructed. So now, I don't think that Trump's view is going to win, but there is going to need to be a, a growing recognition that the domestic political environment of the United States may be shifting and America's role in the world may be more contested in future elections. The second issue that uh, is going to impact on Europeans is the way that, that Donald Trump has totally upended the trade politics in the U.S. The way it had typically transpired in the, in the United States is that trade was a very divisive issue for Democrats, for progressives, that typically saw elite Democrats being very uh, free trade, very pro-trade, very uh, uh, pro-global trade, uh, but Democratic elected officials, particularly in the House and the Senate, uh, breaking down more along the lines of opposing these types of trade deals. The votes typically were about two to one against among Democrats uh, for free trade deals stretching all the way back to the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. The way they passed was because about three to one or four to one uh, among Republicans would vote to support it. So it was a very, very high level uh, of support among Republicans. What Trump has revealed in his campaign, he has been very anti-trade, again, framed in the context of renegotiating these deals, but even he's been more aggressive uh, on, trade, trade, uh, on the trade issue than he has about NATO, uh, and really left no room for any kind of realistic negotiation or, or, or uh, a new type of deal. He's going to be pulling out of these types of trade deals and certainly not be supporting anyone's going forward. What it is revealed is that Republican voters think about trade in a very similar way, in a very similar way to Democrats. Not only has Trump not been harmed by his positions, it's actually helped him and fueled his, his drive to the, to the nomination and is one of the issues that he still uses to the, I mean, to this day. Just last week, uh, President Obama was in Canada for a North American uh, summit uh, with the leaders of Canada and Mexico. Trump delivered a speech entirely about trade, entirely rejecting the premise of the free trade system that has existed uh, uh, so far. So regardless of what happens in the election in November, even if Trump is defeated and defeated resoundingly, it seems that the most lasting impact of his campaign is to be to upend uh, the trade politics in the United States and really change the way uh, we have thought about how uh, to get trade deals through our Congress and communicate them with the American people. Now that's important because not only is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, already been sealed and is going before uh, the Congress potentially uh, this year, but maybe in the future. Uh, but of course the, the TTIP deal, the, the, the trade negotiations with, uh, with Europe, uh, is very contentious both in Europe and in the United States. And this uh, fraught and uncertain political environment uh, um, uh, domestically in the U.S. Uh, makes that, makes that uh, a process a little bit more difficult to see how, see how it plays out. Related to that uh, is this uh, uh, hysteria over the Brexit vote. Um, of course, I've been in, uh, in Europe for most of that time. I haven't been able to see a lot of how it's been transpiring in the United States. But of course, there are uh, similar elements to uh, what uh, motivated uh, the majority, a narrow majority, but a majority of British citizens to vote uh, to leave the European Union. And some of the things that have been motivating and, and, and animating uh, the Trump uh, supporters among the Republicans, which is, again, this, this concern about trade, again, this concern about immigration, a couple things. Uh, this is certainly not a positive thing to note, uh, but unfortunately, the kinds of voters that surprise the pollsters and surprise the political establishment in, UK, in the UK voting against uh, voting ag uh, against staying in the EU, uh, the kind of core uh, working class uh, voters in, in the rural areas uh, that have traditionally and still do back labor in large numbers. Uh, Democrats have already lost those voters. Uh, we lost those voters starting with the Reagan Revolution. Uh, it carried through into the 1990s uh, and certainly culminated in 2000 uh, when Al Gore uh, lost the state of West Virginia uh, to George W. Bush, a state that Republicans have won in every successive election despite, having, despite Democrats having a two to one registration advantage. Uh, and there's twice as many registered Democrats in West Virginia as there are Republicans, but it votes Republican every time. Second issue is that the United States is simply a much more diverse, uh, diverse population and diverse electorate than it is in the UK. 83% of the electorate in the UK uh, was white. 
Uh, it's expected to be 71% in the United States this time, uh, and that number is declining rapidly. It was 74% in the 2012 election. It's expected to be uh, only around the mid-60s by the time we get to 20, 2020. So it's a much more diverse, pop, uh, diverse population. These communities have been in the progressive uh, coalition uh, for a number of election cycles now, uh, and they, they are turning out, uh, they have turned out uh, in large numbers in the past, and of course because of the uh, concerns around the xenophobia of Donald Trump, they are expected to turn out in very high numbers in this election. So, going back to the beginning, there is no reason to panic, but we can't be complacent. This, is an, this has been the most unexpected and unpredictable election cycle that I think anybody in the United States could possibly have anticipated. Uh, now, uh, looking ahead at the next four or five months, there is, it, is, it is likely, it is possible that it could conform to our traditional understanding of how elections are run. Uh, but there is at least some chance that there could be uh, a number of twists and turns between now uh, and the time the Americans vote in the beginning of November. But I think it is looking very strong uh, for Hillary Clinton and uh, that she will be able uh, to, to claim the presidency uh, in November. And whatever uh, uh, the, the, the lasting impacts of Donald Trump uh, will be, we'll be dealing with them, with him not as president, but as a failed presidential candidate. Thank you very much.